Hello, welcome to Bookworms. It's the show where we read a book and then talk about that book. I am your host, Alex. And I'm Joe. How you doing, Joe? Doing good, Alex. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. A long time no see. Yeah, I'm just damn glad you're here. So, we've been doing this for a little while now. We alternate. Who chooses what book? We read it. We talk about it. We love it. Unless it's a book Joe chose. But you guys are in luck, because it's a book I chose this week. It is John Dies at the End by David Wong. Or Jason Perrigan, depending on when you bought said book. Yeah, so I bought this book, my edition, back in like 2008, when Jason Pargan was still using his pen name of David Wong. And I read it originally under that pen name because I borrowed Alex's book, but because I had to buy my own copy, it's a newer edition. Yep, and he, uh, I believe it was 2020, he decided to drop the pen name and just go by his regular name. Yeah, pretty convenient so he could sell more books, I think. I got the classic edition, though, with just the David Wong on it. You know, like uh, David Wong as Jason Pargan or Jason Pargan as David Wong. Mine just says Jason Pargan, nothing about uh, David Wong. Well, that's lame. I did get one with a little bonus material, though, Alex. It includes commentary from the characters and the author. Wow. It was brutal. So he wrote the same thing twice. <laughs> it, it was completely worthless. <laughs> so, yeah, why don't we get into it? Why did you pick this book, Alex? So I'm a big fan of horror comedies, and this book is a horror comedy. And with a title like John Dies at the End, it's it's very eye-catching. It was eye-catching back when I first read it, you know, about ten years ago. And it's still one of my one of my favorite books of that genre, even though on second reading I had some opinion changes on it. Talking about horror comedy, I see your t-shirt today, groovy. <laughs> yes, I got an <laughs> Evil Dead t-shirt on right now, which is, you know, the... The genre-defining movie of horror comedy. Done by Bruce Campbell, the genre-defining actor. So why don't you read the back, tell us what the book is about, and we'll start talking about the book. Well, the thing is, with what the book's about and what the back of my book says, uh, it's it's two different things. But uh, This back of this book reads, Stop! You should not have touched this book with your bare hands. No, don't put it down. It's too late. They're watching you. My name is David Wong. My best friend is John. Those names are fake. You might want to change yours. You may not want to know about the things you'll read on these pages, about the sauce, about Korok, about the invasion and the future, but it's too late. You touched the book. You're in the game. You're under the eye. The only defense is knowledge. You need to read this book to the end, even the part with the bratwurst. Why? You just have to trust me. The important thing is this. The drug is called soy sauce, and it gives users a window into another dimension. John and I never had a chance to say no. You still do. Unfortunately for us, if you make the right choice, we'll have a much harder time explaining how to fight off the otherworldly invasion currently threatening to enslave humanity. I'm sorry to have involved you in this, I really am. But as you read about these terrible events and the very dark epic the world is about to enter as a result... It is crucial that you keep one thing in mind. None of this is my fault. Well then, so my book says complete, something completely different. It's the infamous first book in the best-selling John Dies at the End series and the basis for the cult classic film. Now updated with supplementary material that will only make everything worse. A drug that can destroy the fabric of reality itself falls into the hands of two small-town dudes who are in no way equipped to deal with it. Will anyone make it out alive? The fact that this book has multiple sequels would suggest the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, the first book in a series of currently four books. I don't know if he's planning on writing more, but there's four books now. This was uh, actually like a kind of one of those uh, self-publishing success stories. Uh, Jason Pargan just kind of put it up online for people to read, and it grew into this like cult following. Then he got a book deal and a movie deal. I uh, became like the chief editor for Cracked.com, 
and then his writing career took a, took off in a big bad way and he's he's written on a bunch of books now he's done four books with the John Dies at the End series. He's also got another series, uh, the Zoe Ash series, which is, uh, Futuristic Violence and Fancy Suits is a great book. You should read it. Yeah, and having read the uh, extra book in my copy, he does explain the kind of how this book came about and the way it, you know, it reads. Basically, he was writing a blog, and he got this great idea of creating these characters and putting them in a wacky crazy adventures and next thing he knew he had created kind of a story arc and then he'd go back and kind of edit and change the stories expand on some shrink others uh, put them back out and eventually he realized he had a whole book so he started the long you know long time of uh, trying to query and finding an agent publisher fell right on his face but in that time he edited more you know making it lock together tighter or as tight as it got. And then finally it got enough attention through his self-publishing that he got the movie deal. And then from there, it just went nuts. So, he, you know, he said it was, was like a 10, 15 year process just to get this book out into what we are currently reading. Yeah, and what a, what a book it is. Yeah, so as this was your book of the month, Alex, uh, yeah. You said you were, a, you know, before we hit record, you were a little disappointed on the second read. Well, what what happened? Were you were you shocked that John still didn't die at the end? No, spoilers: John does not die at the end. <laughs> I'm still still bitter about it. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a it's it's a very good book. I feel like I don't know I don't know why, but the second half of this book, it it really starts to drag. Like, the whole middle section you could take out. I don't know if it's because, like, when you did get that book deal, they're like, you need to make this longer to appeal to a wider audience or something like that, but it's it's full of filler. And th- his writing style is filled with, like, over-explanations, and uh, he inserts a ton of jokes into it, which works for the first half of the book really well because it's so chaotic. But then, like, you get to hit page, you know, 200 and it's still doing that, and you got another 250 pages to go, you're like, all right, maybe maybe kind of trim it down a little bit and keep things moving along here. Yeah, I remember the first time I read it, I get to the end of part one, and I'm like, wow, that was awesome. Oh, shit, that wasn't the end? That and was then, just the beginning. Yeah, and you're just like, because it's, part one is such an epic ending to it that it, he could almost have made that a book by itself. He expanded it by another 50, 100 pages, which he easily could have done. And then, you know, make a whole another book out of this, you know, part two. Really, if he'd taken out the bit with, like, Chrissy and going to the mall, and then he didn't have as many, like, time jumps throughout, like, if it was all, you know, takes place over the course of a week instead of a year or two, then it might have, I don't know, worked out a little bit better. But, I mean, it's still a very enjoyable book. Um, yeah, I really I liked, liked a lot of the parts. There's just, I found my eyes glazing over many times, and the, like, the over-explanations, and uh, can, there's some confusing aspects to some of the things that are happening, which I think was his intention, because there's a lot of jumping around, time, like, uh, people knowing the future before and things that are going to happen before they happen and unreliable narrative yeah oh yes uh yeah that is uh that's something that jason pargan really excelled at was creating a un- very unreliable narrator and he even you know the, the character david wong even kind of says it himself at the very beginning of the book he, he basically says yeah i'm i'm lying to you but there's grains of truth in some of this and it's up to you to figure it out yeah and at the end like uh, it's the story's told like from David is talking to a reporter and telling him his story, and like at the very end he's just like, "Yeah, I told you mostly the truth," and like the reporter is like poking holes in the story, like pointing out all the plot holes. Like, it, are there otherworldly entities killing people, or is uh, like or every are you just a massive serial killer yeah, yeah. that's every, killing every, everybody? Because everybody who dies, like. David had uh, opportunity to kill. He was alone with at some point before that person died. And there's like some things he uses to prove his point, 
but at the same time, there's always that question of what is really going on here. Yeah. And so one of my biggest problems rereading this book, well, two of the problems. One is I'm getting old, and a lot of the jokes, I've, I wouldn't say I've grown past, but they just weren't as funny the second time around, even though it's been a long time. Yeah, so yeah, one of the uh, one of the like funny chaotic things is he makes a lot of pop culture references, and this book came out in two thousand seven. So a lot of those pop culture references, even in, like some of the more timeless, rem- memorable things, uh, some of it does make the book feel quite dated. Yeah, and then there's just a lot of dick and fart and poop jokes, which again I I enjoy to an extent, but this was just so over the top. It started getting to the point where Okay, this is getting a little over the top, ridiculous, and it's losing its, it's it's funny. Yeah, there was a there's like one part in the be- uh, middle of the book where it's like, I'd like to take a moment now and talk about my penis, and then he goes on for two pages <laughs> talking about his penis, yeah. and it's great. And, and John talks about his penis quite often. Yeah, that is uh, that is one of his character traits. He likes to uh, over exaggerate everything and talk about his penis a lot. Yeah. How many times can we say penis in this podcast? Do you think? Uh, at least a hundred. So I'm uh, listening to uh, 372 pages uh, right now. It's, they're reading their erotica novel. I don't know if you listen to that one, Alex. I haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Well, they 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 looked in the text for how often they said uh, was it groin or something like that. Oh wait, is it the Mister? Yeah. Oh yeah, I heard that. That's the first one I listened to. Yeah, and uh, they they come up with it like 600 times in a hundred thousand. 120,000 word book. <laughs> yeah, it's always funny when they do like the control F and just do a word search on how many times they use this word. Uh, we should do a uh, E.L. James book one of these days. That'd be a lot of fun. Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you very much. <laughs> but anyway, so the, the the other reason why I had struggled with this book a sec- on the second read is analyzing it. This is not a book that you want to analyze this is a book you just want to sit down and read and taking the notes like we do and trying to dig deeper you know it it made the whole thing a bit of a struggle by the end i started having fun with it where it's like hey let's you know even though the author obviously did not mean for this to have deeper meaning let's try to find deeper meaning in this, this book so i started doing that and just like wow this this book could seriously have some deep messages embedded in here yeah well i saw a deep message on page uh, 331 um he has a uh, internal thought that says maybe you can cut down on the details a little bit <laughs> which uh, i think that is my uh, my biggest note for this book <laughs> so let's start talking about the actual story itself we have a few characters we have you know part one actually is a little bit more character heavy he's got David and John, you got the Rastafarian, you have the the newsman, the, the newspaper man that's getting the story. You, you big have Jim. a big gem, and what's the girl's name? Jennifer Lopez. Jennifer Lopez, and uh, dated pop culture references. Yeah, remember, yeah, remember that. Yeah. Oh story. yeah, you got a. I forget what his actual name is in the book, but he keeps getting referred to as Morgan Freeman, even though he looks like thing like Morgan Freeman or sounds like Morgan Freeman. Yeah, apparently. Yeah, that's a, actually talking about characters. That's another note I had is uh, really from like there's like really can break the book into like three parts. You have the whole thing where they first take the soy sauce and they go and they meet Albert Marconi and stop shitload from summoning Korok, and then there's like the middle part where they're, they're working for Chrissy and they have, find out there's a, a portal to another world in an abandoned mall. And then the final bit where they're trying to save the girl Amy from getting abducted by otherworldly entities. Yeah. And then the 40-page epilogue, <laughs> <laughs> which I, I, made a, I, I took umbrage with. That was, that was rough. I think at that point I was basically stopping taking notes anymore and just trying to pull through it. Yeah, I really stopped, I'd stopped taking like chapter-based notes after part one. And then I just made a couple notes on things that stood out to me. But yeah, let's start. Let's start at the beginning. So, uh, so, the book basically starts off with David Wong giving kind of an introduction to what they're doing. There, it's a kind of a time jump of some point before he's being interviewed, I believe. But after they've ha- 
had the soy sauce in part one happened. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a prologue. It exists like almost out of time with the rest of the book. They reference it towards the end. It's just we it just drops us right into the action of what their life is after they take uh, the drug called the soy sauce. And uh, yes, yeah, the prologue is bonkers. It's great. Yeah, um, it, it's it starts off with kind of a th- those kind of uh, that riddle uh, that people like to kind of put out there to make themselves seem smarter yeah. because again that's what these characters are trying to come off as are these smart guys that make stupid decisions where they're really just stupid guys yeah. making stupid decisions yeah to, uh, to quote another more uh, popular podcast have you ever heard of the ship of theseus uh, no uh so yeah they uh the ship of theseus is uh, a ship goes away and on the voyage they have to replace ev- like every part of the ship and when it comes back, is it the same ship that is returning? Yeah, I've always heard. I've actually heard that the axe one that they were doing this one through uh, Terry Pratchett, who referenced, you know, who's told it better. Hmm. But you know, with with the dwarves, the dwarf kings uh, replacing their axe handles and heads, their war axes, and mm-hmm. is it still Grandpa's uh, same axe if it's been completely re- replaced every part? Which really, there there is no answer. But then we get into, you know, that's kind of, just kind of a aside to, you know, set up a joke. And then they get into the, the craziness of a story. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny opening. It definitely draws you in, but that's really the only point of this. <laughs> like, uh, the uh, the riddle where he's uh, using an axe to chop off a monster's head. And in the process, he breaks the handle of the axe. And then uh, he gets the new handle. And then later on, he has to... Uh, kill another monster and in the process he breaks the head of the axe so he needs to get a new head of the axe and then the first monster comes back and his head's been sewn back on with weed whacker wire and uh, he looks at the axe and he says that's the same axe you cut my head off with and then it asks the question is he right anyways <laughs> we're, we're, we're getting pretty deep into this and yeah, we're only on page two yeah so yeah, we get through the prologue with this crazy story, and then we go into the actual story where we get the reporter, and it's kind of a foreshadowing where this uh, beat reporter is exactly how David would have pictured him to be. And as we learn not much later, that that's how a lot of these monsters appear or even before where the with the girl that uh in the prologue that they both saw a different girl because it was their ideal girl and so you, you get the idea that okay this this reporter isn't who david thinks he is yeah he even points it out at the end when he first meets the reporter he looked just like i imagined him which is established in the prologue that that's kind of a giveaway that they're talking to something that is not human is because it just is, like it can like read your mind and tra- make it l- self look like whatever you want it to look like so the fact that he's talking to someone that he or meeting someone he talked to on the phone and he looks exactly like he pictured him in his mind that's kind of a giveaway or a hint that something's not going on the way it should and this this reporter is reporting the story because there's you know these guys are an internet sensation with all these weird things happening around him and he wants to see what's real and what's bullshit and so he's questioning david on the story and david gets into the origin story which is essentially part one where they find the soy sauce and the rastafarian and how things just go downhill from there and how terrible of a guitarist john is yeah so yeah they're like young 20 somethings they're just just out of high school essentially yeah and they're uh you know they're working dead end jobs you know just like like you do when you're 20 and uh just kind of trying to figure and, out and, and barely to, made it through high school yep. at that yeah troubled past trying to figure out how to make it through in the world no real like career ambitions anything like that and i'm gonna summarize quick they're basically they're at a party with all their buds, uh, John and Dave, they're putting on a rock show, and they meet a guy who's basically just a he. He acts like a Rastafarian. Uh, he's okay. clearly, he's definitely not. He, he's not Rastafarian. Yeah, he's definitely not Rastafarian. He, he's just a totally fake yeah. thing. And uh, he slips them a drug called soy sauce. 
It's hard to explain what the soy sauce does. Yeah, it's kind of like a black, tarry substance that has a mind of its own and is actively trying to get into people. And they never really explain it other than, you know, they get this bullet casing like thing that it just randomly comes and appears in and they take it when shit starts as the fan and it essentially makes their brains hypersensitive and hyper aware they can um they can see into the future time travel all that weird stuff so the effects are very inconsistent they go to an after party or john does with the rastafari and a bunch of other people John ends up leaving, and everyone at, right after he leaves, everyone at the party ends up exploding. Yeah, everyone dies at the party, or at least it's believed they they died. Uh, David starts getting investigated by the cop Morgan Freeman, but uh, the best explanation of the soy sauce I could find was uh, when John, who's also taking the soy sauce, is communicating to David through a dog. He says... Uh, you know that Bugs Bunny cartoon where they spill ink on the floor and then climb through it as if it were a hole? I think that's what the soy sauce is like. It's a hole. It opens you right up. Those worms and other shit in Robert's basement. The sauce let that stuff come into our world by turning people into holes. And I think if the sauce infects enough people in one place, it can make one single big ass hole. And that we, we see a lot of that. We find out like the soy sauce is this way of opening up a portal to another dimension where there's some big-ass monsters that want to enslave and destroy humanity. Yeah, and they have to get... They find out they had to get to Las Vegas to try to stop this, not realizing that they are actually helping these otherworldly beings into getting there. It, it, it's all one, you know, kind of one of those convoluted things of... If if we just stayed home, none of this would have happened. Yeah, they uh, yeah they go to Vegas. Uh, well, they get, they get kidnapped by uh, a a guy who's been possessed by a bunch of these uh shadow people things, and he refers to himself as shitload because there's a shitload of us in here. And uh, they find people from the party, and they all go to Vegas. They wind up at a like a psychic convention and they meet Dr. Albert Marconi who's strangely well versed in this kind of thing and they're able to stop the the evil stuff from happening but it's only the beginning because there's a lot of bad stuff that has been let loose in the world. Yeah, and the the soy sauce after you take it it does wear off but your ability to still perceive the shadow creatures never leaves. The, the after effects, one of the stronger points of the book is showing like the negative effects it has on David versus John because like David he's have, he has like memory loss issues like he experiences massive time jumps where he has no recollection of what happened. like uh, right after the Vegas incident he loses six months of his life. It's like he just wakes up one day and he's all of a sudden he's got a house and a girlfriend. And he doesn't know how any of that happened. He's in pain, and he's like, as the book goes on, he f- shows more signs of like PTSD, and uh, he has a lot of guilt, and uh, like is unsure of how to get away from it. Whereas John is much more like gung ho. He wants to investigate more into these otherworldly entities and monsters that are coming around because he's a very chaotic person. Have you ever known anyone that's kind of like John? We all know that guy. <laughs> you know, just you can you know, super smart, but doesn't actually have any drive, and you're actually kind of thankful for that because that is if he had any drive, he'd be ruling the world, and it'd be a very scary place. Yeah, he's one of those like brilliant but just incredibly self-destructive people. Like uh, David sees into the future, and he sees John drinking himself to death, and it's uh, like it's dark, but there's there's also a lot of humor around it. Know, they're they're both like like aimless individuals and you can have a lot of fun doing that but there's also going to be a lot of pain in your life so yeah so they they get to vegas they have to battle these elvis presley like slugs more more people die and we you know so this is you know we're, we're skipping over a lot here because this whole thing was just so crazy and confusing and you really have to 
actually read it to even try yeah. to get yeah, if it. You haven't, if you haven't read the other books, like you might be able to get away with it, but you got to read this one to to follow along because there is there's so many details. Like I said, this book is wildly overexplained and it's very chaotic. And and, it, and there's a lot of scenes that just have absolutely no relevance. You read it and like, and it's like okay. Then we went here. It's like so. So what was the whole purpose of this? It, and it never comes up again. And it just, you know, just a dead end. Or if it does come back later, you're like, oh, why? <laughs> yeah, I have a. I had a few sections that were just like, why did you put this in here? <laughs> like even uh even on chapter one, the opening sentence is that uh, they say Los Angeles is like the Wizard of Oz. One minute it's a small town, monochrome neighborhoods. And then, boom, all of a sudden, you're in a sprawling, technicolor freak show, dense with midgets. Unfortunately, this story does not take place in Los Angeles. What town do you think it does take place in? Because, you know, I was trying to figure it out. Uh, well, he only, like, the only hint you get is that it's the Midwest. And, and it's a yeah, small the, uh, city. Yeah. And it's, uh, like, it's referred to as undisclosed yeah. in the yeah, book. To protect everyone's identities. Um, it's probably somewhere in like Oklahoma or I was like that. because it's so cold. I was thinking uh, oh, possibly sorry, further north, like could be Indianapolis like or yeah. Minneapolis. Yeah, it could be one. Of, yeah, like Minnesota. That that yeah. would make sense. Also, especially if they have to like go to Vegas, they're up up further up north. Yeah, like you said, because you know, they they talk about especially in part two of the the deeper snow, and I I couldn't th- you know I I didn't look it up, but I was trying to figure out you know how much snow like Indianapolis actually could get. And how cold it gets there? Is there a little bit further south? It's it's, it's that kind of you know the, the, it kind of comes off as those kind of towns. Yeah, just really like insert Midwest city here, and you've probably got it. You got the general feel of it. It's like there's there's not a whole lot going on. It's not a pretty not a pretty place to live, and most people are just sort of trying to exist in it. And that's the other thing in the beginning of the book. He changes the names of everybody. So John's real name isn't John. David isn't David. Uh, Jennifer Lopez isn't Jennifer Lopez. Well, she might have been, but you just you know that bit kind of confusing. But he basically said in you know, the first chapter that I've changed the names of everyone. He does this showing how unreliable of a narrator that David is. He says that he looked online. The most common name is David and. Uh, English the most common David. first name is John. Most common last name is Wong. So yeah. that's why he's John and David Wong. Yeah, but yeah, then the uh, what's his face? The, the the reporter calls him out on it. Says that's not really true. And David's like, just kind of shrugs out. I was like, that's the story I'm sticking with. Yeah, it's funny. The uh, Arnie, the reporter, just kind of pokes holes every time he pops back up, but back into the diner scene, or even when they go to the mall. And look at stuff. He's just poking holes, even though he does get some evidence that what John's saying is true. There's at least David, a grain of what he's saying what is true. What David's saying is true. Oh, I, I keep getting them mixed up. But yeah, well, I actually, I actually have a theory on that, because again, spoiler alert: David dies, and we're, it's revealed at the end of the book. And I want to wanted to know maybe David's real name was John. Ooh, there you go. You know, I said get get kind of deep. That's good fan theory. I said I. You know, I understand. You know, David Wong's supposed to be Jason Pargin there, but may, maybe originally it was like, hey, you know, John dies at the end, but the the one I'm calling John doesn't die. But what you find out, David dies. Maybe that's a giveaway of who David actually is. Yeah, that's a good theory. I didn't think of that. That's a good theory. Fucking a. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's let's jump ahead a little bit. Okay. So, um, we're jump back to the story. Yeah, jump back to the story. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vegas incident happens. And then it jumps ahead six months. David's oh, and, and as we were saying that the at the end of the Vegas because it's so crazy. You're looking at this as like this could have been the book by itself. You could have padded it out another fifty hundred pages easily, and part one could have been its own standalone book. It, because the, the the final battle scene is basically as epic as of a final battle scene as any ending of a Stephen King book could ever hope to be. Yeah, and then we get into book two, uh, titled Korok. And um, like they uh, they go back to their daily lives to start with, working at a video store. They found some money, so David had a house, and John had a really nice car. David had his girlfriend Jennifer Lopez, yeah, not, not the actress. Yeah. yeah, not that Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> but yeah, eventually 
they don't communicate like about what happened like it was a very traumatic event they don't talk about it and, and then the, everything kind of is falling apart for how good it was yeah. none of the these characters are actually able to maintain a normal lifestyle even without the drugs these are just again you know your typical you know losers from that you remember from high school that just never get out of that rut if they won the lottery they'd find a way to blow it yeah it'd be the one of those people that are bankrupt in a year yeah they work at a video store john does some construction stuff and then they john and david start doing private investigation style looks into strange phenomena which is where we get the prologue from it's one of those adventures that they go on and you, uh, you've read the other three books right I've read I read two of the sequels. And I read did, this book is full of spiders and uh, what the hell did I just read? Uh, do any of those books kind of follow in that time frame also, or are they after the part? It all take part two? those take place after. So um, yeah, it's like the characters are getting older. It's a, it's actually kind of fun, especially the third book. Like it's much more modern. So like video rental stores have gone out of business and. David's essentially unemployed throughout that book, and he's this guy is in his late 20s now, and life hasn't worked out for him. He's constantly broke. He's got a lot of mental issues, and he has to, like, it's still funny, but he has to contend with a lot of really depressing facts about his life and his life choices. And it's, uh, it makes, like, there's some character development for him in this book, especially, but, like, that third book, you get, like, almost an entirely new character who's almost a shell of himself. Yeah, so Jennifer Lopez leaves David, and they end up realizing something's going down, but it's just, it's all over the place. You you meet some characters, you don't know if they're going to stick around or not. A lot of them don't. Yeah, because in, like, the first half of book two, we meet this girl Chrissy, who, uh, like, employs them to find a missing person, something along those lines. Uh, their, Their dog, they watch their dog explode. Yeah, their dog blows up after mauling somebody. Of, of, of course, the dog does come back. This is like your favorite soap opera. Nobody's ever truly dead. Then all you know, you get this huge section, like Alex was saying, you just you know, nothing really happened. That you're know, just glossing over it. It's kind of the, the jokes are getting a little bit stale at this point because it's just the same jokes regurgitated. Yeah, I've almost we, no notes for this section. It's, it's like this whole story arc with Chrissy. Uh, you could change in a way, so it's only like a few pages, and they find a portal to another dimension in an abandoned mall in the middle of uh, some crap city. And uh, that's like really the only point of that story, and then Chrissy goes away, and he, she's not in the rest of the book. But she does mail them stuff later, mm-hmm. which yeah, it's a big kind of running joke. Random people mail them random stuff that ends up helping them, and they're not quite sure you know, why all this is happening or how people are able to predict what they need. They just, whatever they get mailed, they store in David's shed. Oh, and this whole time, David knows, or at some point, David realizes there's a dead body in his shed and he's freaking out, thinking, who the hell did I just kill? Because he's getting freaked out over all the time lapses that he's having. Yeah, so those time lapses, especially like that, those time lapses we see at the end of part one, come back in a big bad way and this is where the I feel like the story kind of clicks back in and you get you relevant storyline and yeah, plot yeah you get Amy Big Jim's little sister yeah so Big Jim had died and like his dying words were like take care of my sister which then David promptly did not do yeah. he didn't even know her name at the time <laughs> it's like they gone yeah. to school but he only ever referred to her as cucumber because yeah, of an embarrassing cucumber story because of her puking and again it's it's one of those things where it's just so random that random facts that david knows you're like man this guy might actually be smart nope no he's not he's just stupid and he knows a random fact and then makes fun of a girl that pukes a lot because of her anxiety or whatever medical condition she had yeah you get the feeling that john was not a good person in high school david and john 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 i'm gonna gonna do that this entire time i'm gonna call him david and like i'm gonna call Uh, john john John, you get the feeling that he's just a total douche, but everyone loved him anyways. He's that lovable asshole, but because he's got that personality of a rock star, people will do whatever he says kind of thing. Going back to our time lapses, though. So there's uh, David sitting on his couch, and all of a sudden, he, it's just a half hour later. And 
Then he gets a call from John that they need to look check in on Amy, Big Jim's sister, who's gone missing. And yes, we find out she's also having time lapses. Yeah. And they uh so they go to they go to her house, they see a uh jellyfish creature having sex with a lamp and a giant bag of fat. John starts to realize something where he's he has a gun and the gun's missing a bullet. D- David. I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah, David has a gun and he's missing a bullet. And also, the key to his tool shed is off of his key ring. And he starts to think, like, what the hell is in my tool shed? And so he has to, he, he like, speeds home. He, we meet a guy called Mr. North. Yeah, it, again, it starts getting convoluted and confusing, yeah. uh, jumping around and ruining the story for those who haven't read it. We find out at the end that David killed himself. He Because we find out that there are when they go to this other there's two other dimensions that they know of that are battling with each other you have the uh one that's kind of put on as you know with mr north that are kind of the, the good angels versus the the demons of korok who are this uh kind of a technocrat society of clones and they've been cloning everybody which you get a little uh pie or omega sign stamped on you to yeah, pie pie uh to show that you're a clone you know, they they end up killing a clone Amy, not realizing it's clone Amy. But they David finds out that he's a clone and his clone had killed his actual self, begging the question of, you know, like the beginning of the book, is he still the same person? You know, the, the whole ax question. And basically, because all of his memories are, you know, he has all of his memories from his whole his old life. He has, you know, he still acts the same, still does everything the same way he would. But he just doesn't know if there's going to be some sort of signal where he just goes crazy all of a sudden and starts killing people. In the third book, they play with that, actually. They, uh, they revisit that because, like, Ken David's telling a story, and you find out at the end that he's uh, changed a lot of the details. Uh, I did want to take a quick aside, though, because when he's going home to check his tool shed, um, he, he says something very important. Or he's listening to the radio and... A band comes on, and he's got to he's got to take a paragraph to talk about the band Limp Biscuit. I ground through static and static and static, and then recoiled at the shrill, choking sound of a man apparently squealing through a crushed larynx. After a moment, I realized it was simply Fred Durst and the group Limp Biscuit, Shitload's favorite band. They're the ones who invented the musical technique of feeding a list of generic rap phrases to a goat, and then reading its turds into a microphone over heavy metal guitar. I like that joke. However, that's like a paragraph that could have been a sentence. But you know, talk about the over explanations. He doesn't. He doesn't have brevity in this book. But uh, one one of my favorite things about this book is he comes back to that because after they get back from the other dimension, he's getting a he's getting a he meets a uh, one of those shadow people who's taken on the entity of Fred Durst and is talking to him with like a bunch of yos and brothers and stuff. <laughs> it's, it's really funny. Yeah, and the whole time, like when I was reading this. Uh, D- David is a very uh, reluctant hero. He doesn't want to get involved, and he's always saying, "Let's not do this to John, or let's let's just kind of go home and play video games and do our usual loser activities where we're going nowhere." But by uh, page three ten in my copy, we we get a bit of David's uh, motivation. Basically, he's telling a story about uh, him being bullied in high school and how he ended up at school. The, with uh, special needs, with Amy and everything. And basically w- what happened was he went total psycho on some bullies because he got sick of constantly being put down. And even when he laid laid over and just tried to you know, let them get bored of it, they just upped the ante. And he'd watch all these other kids getting annies up on him. And he decides that, he's no longer going to stand for that and he'll do whatever it takes go as psycho as he can yeah he ends up blinding a kid yeah blinding a kid and the kid ended up committing suicide and david's basically saying good yeah and david yeah david just like had no real repercussions for it because his stepdad's a lawyer and got him uh, rather than sending him to jail got him sent to a uh, mental institution for a few months yeah and that's but that's why David continues fighting these shadow people because he's viewing them as just a bunch of bullies picking on all these 
people that can't stand up for themselves. And he realizes he's one of the few people that can actually fight back. So that's why he, he does it, even though he wants nothing to do with it. So it, it kind of, you know, as you're, you're reading along and you're saying, oh, man, this guy's just a total dickweed. You realize, oh, no, he actually you know, has good reasoning, even if he kind of goes about it sometimes in a wrong way. But at the same time, when you're facing off with these shadow people on Korok, you kind of need that psychotic level of fight back. Talking about his motivations, he also, like, Amy wants to be more involved, and he keeps telling her no. And he tells uh, one of three, like, animal stories that come up rapid fire in the towards the end of the book. So Dave tells the first one where he talks about a muskrat that crawls into a sewage pipe and drowns in shit. And he uses that as, like, a metaphor for, like, yeah, adventuring can be fun. You can explore new things, but also it's incredibly dangerous and you can die in incredibly painful ways and that's part of his reluctance to do it and his uh, insistence that Amy not be involved even though she insists on being involved and then Amy tells a story about a sheep that escapes from the farm and lives in a cave for a few years and then it's like wool gets all overgrown and eventually it's found in return but it never forgets that sense of freedom that it had yeah you get a lot of these pointless aside stories that don't lead yeah. anywhere and then when they finally meet Korok Korok describes a story of a goat that gets stuck and is eaten alive by coyotes to show his like ambivalence towards like like the struggles of humanity. I don't know if that was intentional that he made three animal parables back to back to back, or if that was just like his writing style back then and he was still figuring it out and he just kinda was like hanging on that trope. But it was a uh, it was interesting to see those three characters all tell similar stories for different reasons. Yeah, I, I read a, a book recently that was going into, uh, it wasn't a, a great book, but it, it was going into telling stories, and they tell the same fairy tale over and over and over again, but changing little details that turned out to be key details, and it would completely change the, the story uh, and its meanings by drastic amounts. And, it was, and that's kind of what seems like was happening here. Uh, another book I was reading at the same time of this, which that was a, a haul, was uh, Shostanitsyn's uh, Volume 1 of Gulag Archipelago. So reading a horror comedy and then just plain live horror, act, you know, historical horror, there was actually a lot of parallels you could connect. And, you know, towards the end of this book, I was getting a little annoyed with the uh, over-the-top comedy that kind of lost its shine after the part one. And I started saying, hey, you know, what if I can make connections between these things? And you can, you can actually, even though clearly the author had no intention of having any real meaning in this book other than trying to write something that's funny and good, it, it, you could actually get a lot of deep meaning out of the, the characters and the, the situations and just the, you know, the apathies or how the people react. It was a good psychological, in-depth look into the... You know, the human psyche. I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure either. My eyes glazed over. Anything else? Yeah, you know, the, the um, epilogue was a brutal 40 pages yep. that went nowhere, did nothing. Yeah. I did want to talk real quick about something that the book excelled at, which was subverting expectations. Like, the reason we're talking, like, it's, this book's hard to describe is because you can't really predict what's going to happen, even with the foreshadowing. There's a bunch of, there's a bunch of weird stuff that happens like in mean, the back of the book mentions uh the bit about the bratwurst and like you're like how's the bratwurst gonna play into this and then like john has to communicate to david through a bratwurst phone uh they finally meet like the big bad they meet korok who's this you know he's this god he's this like lovecraftian giant floating uh monstrosity with big eyes and it like starts talking to them and all of a sudden it's uh he uh insults them like you would hear in like sixth grade <laughs> like it's a uh, there I'll, I'll read it and so this is the first line of dial or these are first bits of dialogue we hear from korok and then it goes out and then in my head i heard the high-pitched cackling laughter of a child welcome the alien voice said in my head it sounded like a toddler your wiener is even smaller in person so i, I made a note uh i just wrote uh, korok is apparently 12 it, it it's also hinted that because John's right there, he's hearing something completely different, which is again you, you what 
it's kind of David's thought, like, you know, oh, this is what the big bad's going to sound like because I'm trying to downplay his his scariness. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, the, uh, just the fact that, like, you know, he could have written from the perspective of any character and a lot of the details would be very different. So uh, that's, that's, that's just something that, uh, I don't know, David Wong, Jason Parkin, was really good at it in this book. And really in every, all of his writing that I've read, he's really good at coming up with things that are unpredictable. But that's all I got. Yeah, there's a 40-page epilogue where they just, they come to terms with uh, David being a shadow person. You find out that Arnie is a shadow person because he refers... Uh, your, Arnie tells a story about his days in Vietnam and someone calls him the N-word. And David realizes, like, why is this white guy getting called the N-word? And he finds out that Arnie is a shadow person they, they find the real arnie in the, the trunk of the guy's car yeah. and it was just his ghost driving around not realizing it was dead yeah pulled a six cents there then and there's a there's a somewhat happy ending david and amy start dating uh and it ends in a kind of a funny way where john and dave are playing basketball and there's yeah. a portal to another world and that, that was like half the epilogue and it's like it went it did absolutely had no relevance to anything because they didn't even do anything they just played basketball and then some group some teenagers ended up becoming major heroes i think it was to show that they had become almost inured to these strange happenings like dealt with this huge issue they saved the world and now there's like there's, they get that second calling and they're like oh, it's not my first rodeo and they don't really feel like doing it. They want to finish up their game. There's no sense of urgency or adventure to that anymore. And then, you know, they get to see the teenagers walk in and come back out, uh, having completed the quest that they were asked to do. And they don't even care about that. They just want to keep playing their game. So I got my end of the thing questions. Lay it on me. Right. I'm ready this time. Is the episodic chapters good for the story, or does it make it make the narrative too choppy? Because the way he wrote it, as we said, it was uh, by blog posts and then kind of combining it afterwards into a one one narrative. And some chapters were real short, some were crazy long. And you're just you're reading is like like this is like a fifty page chapter. Or where did this come from? After you just read a bunch of five page chapters. Yeah, the the shortest chapter is one page, and the longest chapter is yeah well over fifty pages. Yeah, there the episodic nature does take a lot out because that first hundred eighty pages is just so great, and that's all one story. And then, yeah, part two gets episodic, and there's those that whole middle episode just it's it's one hundred fifty pages. He could have taken out the book and had a much more streamlined story. So yes, it does it, and it makes it that ending less enjoyable which that ending should have been you know the, it's the big part it's the thing you've been building towards this whole time and i found myself trying to speed read through it hey e even in part one where you know at each chapter it was not always sewn together the best it, you, you could definitely see a, a some you know things didn't quite line up or were being forced to line up so it, it could kind of grate a little bit yeah, and I think uh, John's like unreliable narrator. Dave's. Oh, I did it again. God damn it. <laughs> John would be extra unreliable. Uh, Dave's. Well, we, we do get some stories from, you know, where David's telling John's story, and he even says that, you know, you think I'm unreliable. You know, wait till you hear John's story. And I'm I'm trying to, I'm mellowing it out, you know, leaving out the mo most egregious stuff, and it's still not believable. Yeah, John becomes a perspective character in the uh, second book, and he gets a. His uh his narrative is always really funny to read. When the book changes tone, i.e. we go from drugs and horror to more anti hero or action hero, does your opinion of the story change? Yeah, it does like they be almost become like private investigators and becomes like a murder of the week story. Yeah, it does change. There's a there's a def there's a drop in quality in the book in the second half. Again, I think if you had split the the two parts into two books he could have gone away with the, the horror bit for both of them. But the, the, the fact that he kind of blew his load with the the first half. Graphic. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, he, you know, again, you know, you, you've seen the monster, and we were talking about 
one of the other books uh, with uh, the Hitchcock style writing where you never really often you don't see the monster you only see hints of the monster because once you know the monster it you know, once you can name the monster it loses its scariness yeah if you see a lot of the monster it better be really scary and like we saw like the shadow people weren't really that scary Korok wound up not being too scary because he went for the joke instead with it being a 12 year old boy yeah. insulting him uh, even the the Elvis Presley slug things ended up not being that scary once they were able to you know that that first big battle scene where they're in, in Las Vegas th- those kind of you know kind of lose their edge too what are your thoughts on soy sauce how would you think you would deal with it I really like the way that the soy sauce is handled because it's full effects and how it works and all that's never fully fleshed out and leaving that like talking about how like the monsters become less scary, the soy sauce aspect itself, anything's really possible. It gets really chaotic, and there's no real rules to it. So, and you see, David handles it differently from John because John clearly likes the soy sauce, whereas David wants nothing to do with it. And so, when he experiences the after effects, it wrecks his life. Whereas John's just makes him more gung ho about it. It's a, it's an interesting dynamic, or at least John's described as ha- being more gung ho about it. He he does have his moments of uh, seeing things and being terrified, like the the beginning there where he's got all the phone calls to David, you know, saying come, don't come, come, don't come, and he's hide. You know, when David does get there, he's hiding behind his couch, throwing throwing crap at this invisible being. Would you take the drug, Alex? I would not. How would you think you would react if it took you anyways, like it does David? I think I would uh, become this uh, otherworldly hero. I would save a lot of lives. Would you be David or would you be John? I would be, I would be neither. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be Alex. You'd be Amy? Yeah. I would save lives. I'd be a hero. I would. I would be you loved mean, and adored in your, in by yourself everybody. Every time you I would quiet, open a door, I would quietly endure the side effects so that I can better serve my fellow man. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> or would you just be the one of the people that just exploded as soon as you took it? <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> it does seem weird that those two, for whatever reason, are relatively immune to the worst of the side effects. Yeah, it probably kills like 99.9% of anyone who takes it, but they somehow have this constitution that allows them to yeah, because muscle even, through. Because even the, the cops that end up getting it somehow end up going nuts and becoming portals for those bee things. Okay, and I know we kind of covered this a little bit, but what's up with John, and why is the book called John Dies at the end if he doesn't actually die? What What are your thoughts, having read some of the other books? I mean, do you think do you think it was just a catchy title? You think it's like, oh, at the end of the series, if it comes a series, John will die because eventually everyone dies, you know, no matter what. I don't know do if he was planning on writing a, a complete series when he first came out, so maybe John will die at the end of the series. Um, he mentions John dying, like drinking himself to death, in the book, uh, like in the future. It could be a reference to that. Um, it's def like the title was definitely just a, uh, you're browsing through the bookshelves and you see a title like that and you're like, Oh, I'll give this a look. Uh, it's definitely a marketing strategy for that title. Yeah. I you still, know. I still like my theory of, yeah. uh, David is I, actually John. I like that theory too. That's yeah. Cause John, idea. John never even really comes close to dying. No, the, 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 story. The, the, the closest was actually in the beginning when he, almost you know when he's so high on the soy sauce he goes catatonic and he's everyone thinks he's dead uh, that's about the only time he even came close and you're reading is like well this is you know i'm only 60 pages in here and john died already i thought he died at the end <laughs> I, I like that idea of david actually being john that's probably why i keep confusing their names probably yeah that's uh, that's the actually that's the explanation because I keep, the, I'm not the, making the mistakes. Alternate dimension. Yeah. You're like you're you're yeah. you're, you're connected yeah. to it. That soy sauce is working hard right now. Yeah. I'm not consistently making the same mistake over and over again. I just know this for a fact that David is actually John. Final thoughts. So I don't. I didn't have a lot of questions. I mean, it's not 
you know, a serious enough book to actually have a lot of real questions. And again, it was just so crazy and over the top. You know, it's, it's hard to prepare questions for this kind of book. Yeah, it is. It's crazy. It's over the top. It was a lot of fun to read uh, the first time. The second read it is uh, it's a little harder to get through. I just I, longer books in general. I'm not a huge fan of. Um, yeah, like, our, our competition yeah. has put that out there. Our, we have a Goodreads competition. Uh, you have to read, take two out of three categories. Either mo- you know the categories are most books, most pages, and pages per book. And Alex will usually average between, between 60 and 100, pa- 100 books a year. His pages per book are usually closer to about 250. Where, yeah, and so, you know, total pages uh, between me and him tend to be similar, even though he's read, you know, sometimes twice as many books as I have. Yeah. Yet our, our scores are, you know, it's act, an actual competition. Unlike Becky, who just reads shit tons of books <laughs> yeah becky always blows us out of the water except for the last two years it's not happening this year bud yeah she's, no she's she, got me this year yeah she she's she's going for 100 books all 400 plus pages and she may do it <laughs> yeah i mean you could do a deep dive into this book there is a lot of character study in it especially with john and uh, especially with david i caught myself that time especially with david and like how he's like he's slowly breaking down throughout the course of the book and he becomes this reluctant hero that he never wanted to be and it's a fun take on seeing somebody who's become something he doesn't want to be and how he manages the stress and the trauma from those experiences yeah for for me this book kind of drove me nuts at times kind of was you know a lot of the jokes had gone a little stale reading it the second time, but I st- I still enjoyed it. I, I know you downgraded it from a five star to a three and a half star. I think I downgraded it from a four star to a three star. But yeah, you know, it was well written. Uh, the the characters were pretty well written. Uh, John and Amy were definitely really funny. They had good wit and sarcasm and. They they weren't just two dimensional. They're you know when you start to think you figured out who they are. Uh, Jason would also write something about them that totally threw you for a loop and like, well oh, that, that that makes a much more complex character. David uh, annoyed me. He was often whiny and whatnot. You know, t- typical reluctant hero of oh I don't want to do this. Oh poor me. But at the same time, it 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 felt honest. It felt like. It, that's probably how someone like that would be. It's very well written for a guy who, as far as I know, he didn't really have a lot of like a writing background. He wasn't like trained or anything like that. He was just like in between his uh, working two data entry jobs, would uh, post silly stories online, and it grew from there. Yeah, he made a career out of it. So good for him. Yeah. Uh, our thesis question again. We've kind of touched on this quite a bit so we'll just rush through it quick is this book meant to be just a fun diversion or can the reader take a more serious aspect buried in the text as something to grasp on and find meaning i will i would argue that every book has at least a little bit of meaning to it uh even really butcher and run (laughs) even (laughs) even the trashy detective novels you can you can find something in there that teaches you something um, this book is probably like its main intention is to be entertaining. Like you're not going to read a, any book if it's not entertaining, no matter how deep it is. However, yeah, it's it's there's there's more just to read and enjoy than there is to I guess kind of take away. It's not it's not one of those life changing novels, even though it's one that I read a decade ago and really loved it, and it's stuck with me. I don't talk about, you know, it's like, it's a great observation on uh, the human condition. It's, uh, it's just one of those things, like, it's got great kooky characters, it's got a great sense of humor and levity, and there's some genuine drama and action in the story, and it's it's a really good package of a book. Yeah, having read the, the afterword, the author clearly meant this just to be a funny excursion for him, a fun writing exercise that wasn't meant to be anything thought deeply about, just a comedy routine type type thing. As I said, I was reading Gulag 
Archipelago Volume One, and trying I can't to even get through the title of that book. Yeah, it's, it's 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 a tough one. Having reading that at the same time, where they you know you're really getting some deep philosophical concepts, and struggling through the the drier parts of this book, it's, you know, it was definitely a fun exercise to say, hey, let's try to find you know some extra meaning, see if there are stuff or if it's just all silliness and rookie writing you know good writing but still rookie writing on a uh on a on an old story and said it's it's definitely juvenile is funny but if you want to challenge yourself if you're if you did struggle to get through this definitely go that other route and just just to make it entertaining for you that's all i got alex you got anything else that's all i got for this one okay entertaining book Highly recommended. I, I wouldn't highly recommend it, but I recommend it. You definitely have to be in the right frame of mind, right sense of humor. Yeah, I, d- I still highly recommend it. It's it's still a memorable book. And we'll revisit it again in ten years, and my opinion will be changed on it again. Uh, it will drop from a five star to a three and a half star to a one star. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what the hell did I just read? And that's the third book. <laughs> so that is John Dies at the End by... David Wong slash Jason Pargan. 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 Silly goose. Yeah. Next month, we will be reading a book of my choosing. And this one is going to be epic. You're going to laugh. It's going to be really long? L- longer. I think shorter than this one. Here, let me look at the pages here. It's definitely smaller in stature anyway. I'm calling, I wouldn't call it a full-on epic. It's, it's the same length. But it's, you know, I got the, the soft cover here. It is Night Watch by Terry Pratchett. So you're going to go from rookie comedy horror to one of the best comedy writers of all time. Definitely of our time. Yeah, Pratchett's one of the goats. His uh, Discworld series is uh, it's, uh, it's this huge sprawling thing. That he's uh, did really well with. Yeah, it was and like 40, 50 books. Yep, 40, series. 50 books that he put in his lifetime. Hundreds of millions of copies. Uh, I'd say Discworld is up there for fantasy worlds. Like with, I put it with Narnia and all Middle Earth and all those other big ones. Yeah, it's definitely created. It's you know he he wrote so prolific, and created such a detailed world. This is definitely one of the most known worlds for the fantasy lovers. I chose this book because it's probably my favorite out of that whole series. It's one of the last ones for his Night Watch uh, sub-series. The good thing about Discworld is you don't have to read any of them in order. You can just read them all as standalones. I, when I first time I read this back in college, it was it blew knocked my socks off. And I had already read a bunch of Terry Pratchett books by the time I got to this one, and this one just blew them all out of the water. It's one of the few books in a series that, like, like later books in a series that introduces time travel as a plot point, and you're not like, he's running out of ideas. It's like, <laughs> oh, this is actually a really good idea. Yeah. And and the, the thing with Terry Pratchett is he will, you know, you could read it uh, any way you want to. If you just want a fun story, you can read a fun story. If you want to get deep into it, he'd take really high-level concepts and smush them together. He'd take three or four concepts for every novel he ever wrote, smush them together, and just make these great works of art. And so this is definitely one of his better works for the Discworld series. So, next month, Night Watch, Terry Pratchett. And we'll get into way too much detail and ramble about it then. If you like this podcast, please subscribe, like, whatever you do for a podcast on your podcast. Buy, uh, buy multiple phones and download it onto all yeah. of them. Or just mo- download on multiple uh, different apps or multiple times on the same app. I'm pretty sure it uh, all it all goes into our thing. We are hosted by uh, Podbean. The link for that will be in the show descriptions you can comment and on there we are doing bonus episodes so stay tuned look for those we have an instagram at kendall bookworms where we just post whenever we're posting videos but follow us on that we have an email kendall bookworms at gmail.com 
you can talk to us there. At least talk to you. At least talk to me. I'm, I'm the more vocal one anyways. Alex will ignore you for weeks. He's, he's the one who actually checks his emails and responds in a timely fashion. Pretty much. And as I said before, if we get enough comments, questions, whatever, they, they may get put into a bonus episode also. So definitely do that. Alex, do you have anything else? Did I miss anything? You just did it so perfectly. I was just listening the whole time. Okay, yeah, I see. I hope you like this book as much as I did, or more. And until next time, this has been Bookworms. Out.